Hello, I am Dr. Keith Burke. I'm a professor of behavioral sciences in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program at San Diego City College. The AODS program is a fully accredited state-funded vocational job training program for students who are studying to be certified alcohol and drug counselors. The AODS program covers all of the coursework necessary to sit for the state certification exam. Uh, as well as covers all of the topics that you need to know to pass that exam. Uh, the AODS program is uh, not only fully accredited, but it is college level coursework that can be used in the pursuit of associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and as preparation courses for uh, graduate level degrees. So today I am going to talk about contingency management in the treatment of co-occurring disorders. All right, contingency management has been used as a primary evidence-based practice for treating co-occurring disorders for over 30 years with consistent research evidence that it improves treatment outcomes. Uh, really, outside of motivational interviewing and solution-focused counseling techniques, contingency management techniques are probably uh, amongst the most popular and frequent types of interventions that are used in substance use treatment facilities and facilities that treat both substance use and mental health disorders. Uh, contingency management has been shown to be very effective regardless of client characteristics or pre-existing conditions, uh, meaning that it's effective for everybody essentially, and no matter what condition a person's coming in, whether it's their first time in treatment or their fourth time in treatment, uh, whether they've got severe persistent mental illness and a substance use disorder, or they've got uh, more mild mental health symptoms, uh, it's simply effective. So contingency management is not typically a standalone intervention, uh, meaning that it both can and should be used with other evidence-based interventions in treatment. So contingency management is a form of behavioral therapy, uh, meaning that it is primarily trying to impact behaviors. It uses operant conditioning, uh, which is a well-established way to control behavior through a series of rewards and punishments designed to increase behaviors and decrease some others. So the idea here is that we can control behavior by rewarding uh, some behaviors, ones we want to see more of, and punishing behaviors that we don't want to see as much of or as often. Contingency management is used to increase client motivation to change and to encourage long-term changes. Now, contingency management is most often implemented as an agency policy, which is a bit different than many of the clinical interventions that we talk about for alcohol and drug counselors. Uh, it, an alcohol and drug counselor could, of course, implement a series of rewards and punishments uh, designed to impact behavior, but most often you're going to see this on an agency-wide level, meaning the agency will have certain types of things uh, that are designated for rewards and other things that are designated for punishments. We'll talk more about that in just a second. So the basic premise of contingency management is that the form or frequency of, be of a behavior, meaning the form of behavior, what is it? And the frequency of that behavior. So examples of this is not using substances. So substance use would be a type of behavior. And contingency management is trying to impact this by encouraging people to not use substances or taking medications as prescribed. This is a type of behavior, uh, the frequency of which is that you take your medications according to the prescription and we're trying to impact that. Or attending appointments. If an individual is in an outpatient treatment program, they're required to come to three groups a week and their attendance has been inconsistent. Some weeks they've come three times, some weeks they've come once, some weeks they've come twice. Uh, then the idea here is can we impact the frequency of this behavior and get this person here three days a week as they're supposed to be. So the idea is that these behaviors can be impacted through a planned and organized system of rewards and consequences. That part is important. A contingency management program works best when it is planned and organized. Everyone is very clear what the behavior is that is being impacted and what happens exactly if that behavior is done or not done according to the schedule. So the word contingency management uh, comes from contingent. 
So to be contingent means it's dependent upon or occurring only if some circumstance is met. So the idea here is that something happens which causes an action or a response which may be pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, real basic early contingency management, um, you know, when children are growing up, they learn that doing certain things causes something that's pleasant or unpleasant. So like, in other words, a child reaching up to touch a hot stove, that is the action, which is causes then a response, which is that my fingers are burned. I don't want to do that. So that essentially is a punishment. And that punishment will then shape a behavior where that child probably won't reach up and touch a hot stove any longer. You know, or, uh, you know, the uh, child is asked to clean up, you know, their toys and put them in the box. And when they do that, then they're allowed to have some ice cream, right? So the action is pick up my toys, uh, which causes me to be able to have ice cream. So that's going to encourage me then to pick up my toys uh, whenever my parents tell me to do so. So the idea in contingency management is that we're working on that basic premise, if X, then Y. Now, this is formed on the basic behavioral principles that reinforcing and rewarding increases behavior and punishment decreases behavior. There's really no debate on this at this point. There is enormous amounts of research showing that humans are basically behavioral beings and that contingency management works on a very basic level with every human in every continent and every country across the world. So these principles are used in everyday life with people even when they're not in treatment. Uh, parents use allowances to encourage their children to make their beds or dessert in order to eat their dinners. Uh, employers use salary increases and bonuses in order to reward good job performance. Law enforcement delivers fines if we drive too fast. So if you stop, stop and think about it for just a second, you will find many examples in your own life in which your behaviors are being shaped by contingency management as well. So there's abundant evidence that if certain behaviors are reinforced or rewarded, they are more likely to occur in the future. Now, I wanna talk about uh, this one study, which is not particular to substance use or mental health treatment, uh, but it was a very large study about the long lasting impacts of using incentives. And large studies are more reliable. Uh, without going deep into statistical analysis, essentially, if you have a study that only involves three people, for example, uh, two people did this and one of the people did not, well, that's not a very reliable study, meaning that it may not be able to be replicated. It's not something that we can count on. Uh, the sample size is very, very small. So typically, very large sample sizes will mean that the study is more reliable. You can depend upon it um, and the results that it shows. So this was a huge study involving eight thousand children at 40 elementary schools. So very, very large sample size. So any results from this is going to tend to be more reliable. So the experiment was they used contingency management to pay the children to eat fruits and vegetables. So the way that worked was that at lunchtime, students who ate at least one serving of fruit or vegetables were given a 25 cent token that could be redeemed at a school store, the carnival, or at a book fair. Now, understandably, there was an immediate spike in fruit and vegetable consumption. So kids weren't stupid, right? Eat fruits and vegetables, I get a token, I can use that token to get rewards. So that wasn't actually what the study uh, was studying. So this was the key research finding from the study, is that two months after the incentive ended, 44, almost half of the children were still eating at least one more serving of fruits and vegetables than they did before without receiving any additional incentives. So they got it, right? Uh, eat fruits and vegetables, go get a 25 cent token that I can use for a reward, that immediate spike, right? Everybody did that. But then the study ended. Okay, we're no longer giving tokens for eating fruits and vegetables. And in spite of that, almost half of those people were still eating more fruits and vegetables, even though there was no longer any incentives. 
So this was very strong evidence that the incentives had both short and long-term impacts on eating habits. Now, again, this study is not particular to substance use or mental health or co-occurring disorders, although there is a wealth of evidence that shows the same thing with, uh, with co-occurring disorders in general. But this was a huge study. So far as I know, there's been no study on contingency management with substance use disorders or mental health disorders that was quite as large as this one. Nonetheless, this study is support, it's evidence-based support that implementing an incentive program can produce changes in behavior that persist long after those incentives are removed. Now, substance use is particularly suited to behavioral modification because it already has basic behavioral principles. So substance use is self-reinforcing. You, you take the substance or use the substance, right? You, the, the person smokes marijuana and it feels good. So there's an immediate reward for the behavior. Smoking marijuana feels good for some people. Some people are creating anxiety and paranoia and other things, in which case then we might have the opposite example of this, contingency management with punishments. Uh, but anyway, you get the idea, self-reinforcing. You take it and feels good, repeat. Take it, feels good, repeat. Take it, feels good, repeat. Now, this is a basic learning and conditioning schema. That's the foundation of behavioral reinforcement. Get rewarded, repeat the behavior. And there's ample evidence that when we learn behavioral reinforcement and condition it, that can then be unlearned and reconditioned. Uh, without going into a long, uh, neuropsychological discussion about the brain and how the brain is conditioned. Essentially, uh, behaviors, the reinforcement of behaviors creates reinforced neural pathways, a little like wagon wheels, you know, going across a field where the, the wagon wheels get etched into the earth and it's a very easy and obvious path for the wagons to take. That is a foundation of behavioral reinforcement, the, the neural conditioning to um, uh, reinforce and repeat a behavior. But this learned behavior can then be applied to other types of behaviors, meaning that if you're able to lay down these tracks with one type of behavior, you'll be able to lay down these tracks with another type of behavior. And so the idea is that learned conditions can then be unlearned or reconditioned or behaviors replaced with a different behavior. So if someone smokes marijuana and the immediate reinforcement is that it lessens their anxiety, well, then they may repeat smoking marijuana because it lessens anxiety, which it does, at least initially. Long-term use, it will tend to increase anxiety, but initially it will work. So then the idea is that the tracks are already laid down. So now if a different behavior is used, practice deep breathing lessens anxiety, then we can reinforce that easier because the original tracks are already laid down. All right. So contingency management in the treatment of co-occurring disorders uses the same basic behavioral principles through a system of rewards and punishment that addresses both substance use and mental health. So the idea is that we can use rewards to target and reinforce a behavior, such as maintaining sobriety. So if a person uh, is given a certain number of urinalyses, uh, drug testing, and they pass the drug test, then they, we reinforce that by providing them some kind of a reward. So the target is we're trying to maintain sobriety. You know, or uh, if someone takes their medications as prescribed, you know, over 30 days, they've taken their medications as prescribed and we reward that behavior. Um, or we reduce problematic behaviors through a series of punishments. Again, the use of substances uh, may require uh, an additional 30 days in treatment, you know, some additional type of punishment. Um, you know, attempting to self-harm, you know, means that um, you may not have access to razor blades in your toiletries for a period of time. If you act out in group, then you uh, may be required to clean the hallway afterwards. So the idea is that we are uh, reducing problematic behaviors by implementing punishments. All right. So for those of you who are watching this video as part of a course at San Diego City College that you're receiving credit for, this is the key phrase non sequitur. 
You will be tested upon the conclusion of this video, and one of the questions will ask for the keyword or key phrase. This key phrase will not be on the PowerPoint slides, and students are only going to know this key phrase if they actually watch the video. So the key phrase for this video is, be the change that you want to see. Again, be the change that you want to see. All right, now back to our scheduled programming. So contingency management has been proven in numerous studies to be an effective approach to promoting abstinence and treatment adherence in substance use and mental health treatment. And in fact, in at least one study, contingency management was found to be more effective than cognitive behavioral therapy, which is often touted as one of the most efficient evidence-based practices out there. Now let's talk about the foundational principles of contingency management. The foundational principles is that reinforcing or reward is a consequence that increases the likelihood that a behavior will reoccur. So think about consequence in a neutral way. If something happens, then the consequence is this. So a reinforcement or a reward is a consequence that will increase the likelihood that the behavior will reoccur. And a punishment is a consequence that will decrease the likelihood that the behavior will reoccur. Now, a positive consequence refers to the application of a stimulus uh, following a behavior, meaning that you're getting something. So you're getting a reward or you're getting a consequence. Negative refers to the withdrawal or the termination of a stimulus following a behavior. In other words, if you have a positive consequence, you're getting something, whether that's a reward or a punishment. If you have a negative consequence, it means something is being taken away, whether a reward or punishment. So let's put this together. Positive reinforcement means that the person will receive a reward, which is contingent upon meeting a certain therapeutic goal. So they will be given prizes, given vouchers, given privileges if they do something. Uh, so attending, you know, all groups on time for this week means that you are able to go on the outing to the Mission Beach um, Carnival, um, or not Carnival, the uh, roller coaster down there. Um, so the idea here is that you are given a reward for doing something. Now, a negative reinforcement means removing an undesired, unpleasant, or confining condition. So if your cell phone was taken away from you because you were using it in group, uh, and if you participated appropriately in group for a week, and you were given your cell phone back, so the cell phone was essentially a type of unpleasant punishment, and the negative reinforcement means we're taking it away. So positive reinforcement means you are receiving a reward. Negative reinforcement means that something unpleasant is being taken away, which would be rewarding. Positive punishment is the delivery of an undesirable consequence when there's evidence of an undesirable behavior. So being given a slip or a hash mark if you do something that's undesirable. Uh, you showed up late to group. Uh, you are required to clean the bathroom. You have to do a mandatory study because you failed to present your assignment at work. So positive, meaning you're being given something. Here it's a positive punishment. And a negative punishment involves taking away a positive condition. So uh, perhaps this is a residential treatment program and after 30 days, um, or after two weeks, the person is allowed to use their personal vehicle to, uh, you know, go get food or go to the store or something like that. Um, but because they acted out in some way, uh, they failed, um, they failed a UA, they failed to take their medications, then what happens is they lose the privileges. So it's being taken away from them. So again, positive means something's being delivered. Negative means something's being taken away. And each can be used for both punishments and rewards. Now, out of all of those things, research indicates that positive reinforcement, in other words, receiving a reward, has a much longer lasting effect than any kind of punishment. The 
uh, research seems to indicate that when people know there's punishments related to a specific circumstance or condition, then they will shape their behavior primarily to avoid punishment in that specific circumstance or condition. But positive reinforcement has a greater global impact on self-esteem and decision-making. Uh, meaning that uh, when people do something and they're given a reward, they feel good about themselves and they tend to then do good in other areas rather than just focusing on doing good in that one area. So again, with punishments, people learn to avoid acting in one very narrow specific instance, whereas with positive reinforcement and rewards, people then tend to use that to apply it in a number of other types of situations. All right, so implementing a contingency management program. So what that means then is implementing a system where some things are rewarded and some things are being punished. Again, these can be positive rewards or negative rewards. They can be positive punishments or negative punishments. So the idea in implementing a contingency management program is to first choose a behavior that you want to change. So the behaviors that you want to impact should be objectively quantifiable. What that means is they need to be specific, measurable, and observable. They need to occur frequently and they need to be related to treatment goals. So an objectively quantifiable treatment goal might be to attend all three outpatient treatment groups this week. So the specific action is attend the treatment groups. The measurable part is three, each of the three days that they're assigned this week. And I'm going to know whether you attend it or not because you're going to be there. Now, a very vague idea would be to participate well in the three group therapy sessions this week. So participate well is not objectively quantifiable. So there's nothing specific there. Like what does participate well mean? Does that mean just show up? Does that mean speak up? Does that mean be supportive of other people, hand in assignments? We don't know, right? We don't know how many times the person's supposed to do this. Are they supposed to participate well for one group, all three groups, every minute of the group? Uh, how are we going to know if they're participating well? So again, contingency management only works when you've got an objectively quantifiable behavior that you are attempting to change. So negative substance use tests, whether that's a UA or breathalyzer or, or blood test, that's objectively quantifiable. So you need to have a negative substance use test. It's specific, you need to take the test, it's measurable, it needs to be either positive or negative. It's observable in that the person administering the test will know. Uh, involved group participation, attending psychiatric appointments, completing homework, filling out job applications, these are all objectively quantifiable. Now, contingency management works best when there are reasonable expectations for achieving goals. So let's say, for example, it's a 90-day treatment program or even a 60-day treatment program, since there's not that many 90-day treatment programs left out there any longer. So let's say it's a 60-day treatment program. So a contingency management program would not typically choose to reward, you went to every single group counseling session from the day that you arrived until the day that you leave. So the day that you leave, you're going to get an ice cream cone. That's not a reasonable expectation, and people have a hard time following contingency management programs in which there's this huge, long stretch period of time. So a more reasonable expectation would be attending all of your groups on time this week, or even attending all of the groups on, you know, on time for the next two weeks. Some kind of a reasonable expect expectation uh, that people should be able to get to. Now, for rewards and punishments, essentially, that is going to be dependent upon an agency in most cases. You need to determine what the available resources are that can be used for rewards. So oftentimes, in-house vouchers or tokens that can be exchanged for goods or services, uh, prizes, you know, maybe there's some kind of a grab box, you know, where a person can reach inside and inside that box or uh, you know, uh, Starbucks gift cards and, um, you know, other things like that. Uh, increased privileges. That's a, a big one. Most treatment programs have some kind of a blackout period um, early in their treatment in which there are more restrictions as they are assessing the person and the person settling in. Uh, but then over time, they, there is an increase in privileges so long as they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, they're allowed to leave the facility. 
uh, skip one group a week. I mean, there's many different ways that privileges can be given and they don't cost anything. Uh, passes to leave the facility, movie tickets. Um, these are all resources that can be used as rewards and that needs to be determined before implementing a contingency management program. Identify punishments that are unpleasant or uncomfortable, but do not cause pain or trauma. So losing privileges, you have to give me your phone and you can have it back at the end of the day. That's unpleasant and uncomfortable, but that's not necessarily traumatic. Uh, you need to attend an additional group this week. Um, they may not want to do that, you know, but that's not traumatic. Additional cleaning duties in the facility, etc. So using a trauma-informed care approach, the punishments need to be done in a way that doesn't potentially re-traumatize someone, while at the same time, deliver what the purpose of a punishment is, which is to make something unpleasant so that the person does not want to do it again. Uh, there's also interesting research that shows that too intense of a punishment actually will provoke avoidance, aggression, and undesirable behaviors. Um, so the person will may act out if the punishment seems too intense or too unfair, which defeats the purpose of we want it uncomfortable enough that, it, that they don't do that behavior any longer. And then the monitoring and reinforcement of a schedule. So the schedule means that there, there's knowledge of when to deliver reinforcement or punishment, um, and you use this through the application of basic behavioral principles. Um, so um, you, every Friday, people will be evaluated, their group attendance this week will be evaluated. And, you know, those people who attended all the groups on time, you know, will be given a voucher for a free cup of coffee. Uh, that will be assessed on Fridays, and the vouchers will be given out Friday after the last group. So that would be the set schedule for when the behaviors would be reinforced um, or tallied up. And you want to keep the schedule or system simple so that staff can apply those principles consistently and the clients understand what's expected of them. Now, the most effective contingency management program uses frequent positive reinforcement and infrequent negative punishment. So negative punishment is taking away a desirable condition. This has the best and most long lasting impacts. The both the reinforcement and the punishment should be delivered immediately or as close as possible after the target behavior is evident. Um, so in other words, you know, if somebody, um, you know, does something, they show up late to group on Monday, but then it's not until the following Wednesday that they're told, oh, hey, you remember last week on Monday, uh, you showed up at group late, uh, so you got to give me your phone now, you can't use your phone today. Uh, that's not going to have as much effectiveness as when the punishment or reward is delivered immediately. And if the undesirable behavior is due to insufficient skills, the punishment must be preceded or accompanied by training. So let's say that um, a client has an assignment due. They were expected to complete a handwritten relapse prevention plan by Friday and Friday comes and the person didn't turn it in. So the idea might here might be that there's a contingency management program that says if you don't complete your assignments before the due date, uh, you know, then you lose some privilege or you're given a hash mark or something like this. But maybe the person was absent. They were sick on the day that group talked about the relapse prevention planning. And so they don't know how to finish the relapse prevention plan, in which case, just punishing a person isn't going to be very effective in terms of stopping an undesirable behavior. So if they're doing it because they didn't know how to do it, they don't have the skills to do it, then there needs to be something before punishing uh, that provides the level of training that they need in order to accomplish it. All right, punishments are most effective when delivered every time there is evidence of a negative condition and educating why the punishment's being delivered with clear instructions on how to avoid it. So let's say that it's a residential treatment program and all the clients that are in the residential inpatient treatment program have some kind of chores. Uh, maybe in the morning, you know, there is coffee and breakfast and a um, certain number of clients are assigned to clean up the eating area, you know, after morning breakfast. And so they don't clean up the, the area. 
So the administrator goes in and they see there's coffee cups laying around all over the place and you know there's, there's all kinds of food. And so what they need to do then is as soon as first group is done, they grab the three people that were required to clean up the kitchen and they deliver a punishment. Uh, you're gonna get a hash mark for this and you, um, you know, can't uh, go outside with everybody during free time this afternoon, you know, until the eating area is cleaned up. And so then a week goes by and then the same thing happens. So the problem here would be is if the person didn't punish them the second time that the kitchen wasn't cleaned, but they did punish them the first time, then this isn't going to be nearly as effective for eliminating the undesirable behavior. So it needs to be delivered every single time. Again, with an explanation of why the punishment's happening and how to avoid it. Now, curiously, the research has shown that rewards that are delivered on a fixed schedule um, can be effective, but they're actually more effective when people don't know when they're gonna get rewarded. Not every time, like slot machines. So this is an important slide to understand. So punishments are most effective when they're delivered every time there's evidence of a negative condition. But rewards are often most effective when they're given not every time, but after a variable number of responses. Um, so, you know, maybe um, the people that are cleaning up the kitchen, you know, they're punished for it, you know, this week and then next week they do a really great job. And on Friday, unexpectedly, uh, they're all given a reward. They're given a, a voucher that they can use at the, the agency store uh, because they did such a good job cleaning the kitchen. Well, if Monday comes around and you reward them again, and then on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, uh, that it's not as effective, whereas if you reward them periodically, they don't know when the, when the reward is coming, then they tend to put more effort into it. Informal rewards like using praise and affirmations can definitely be delivered more regularly. Okay, and then the other aspect of a contingency management program is the contingency contract. So uh, contingency management works best when clients are told beforehand this is what the deal is, this is what the program is, this is when you will be rewarded, and this is when you're gonna be punished. Um, so the clients need to be informed about this, and it's best when it is put down in writing. There's some kind of a formal written agreement that clearly defines the behaviors that are gonna be modified. Um, in other words, uh, if you have no positive UAs for the first month that you're in our outpatient program, you know, then your reward is that you only have to come to group three days a week versus five days a week. So you know that coming into the program, you know what it is that you're shooting for or targeting for. Um, how is the program going to be monitored? Meaning who is going to be keeping track of these behaviors? The counselor is going to be observing this uh, by turning in your homework. You know, it gets checked off. And what the specific types of rewards and punishments are and what the reinforcement schedule will be. Uh, people function best when they understand what it is that they're trying to get or what it is that they're trying to avoid. Be very specific in the contract about um, what the behavior is that you're attempting to address. And then you want to address alternative interpretations that clients may have about behaviors. So um, attending group versus participating in group. So if people are given rewards, you know, for participating in group, and you know, rewards are doled out on Friday and three people get a voucher and the other two people don't. And they say, hey, I went to group, you know, like what, what's the deal? Why didn't I get it? Yes, but you didn't participate this week. You basically sat there, you didn't speak unless you were called upon, you gave one word answers. So these are the type of alternative interpretations that should um, be attempted to figure out before you implement the program. Um, it goes back to objectively quantifiable. Are we making sure to consider the specific behavior we're trying to impact and make sure that we've considered how clients may misunderstand this? When there is legitimate questions or confusions about something, uh, the procedures should be updated to account for that in the future. So maybe in this case, what we say is, you know, active participation in group means that you volunteer information, you participate spontaneously, you provide support to your peers versus you just show up. 
And contingency management programs should also clarify whether clients can catch each other meeting the target goals or doing the opposite, meaning are other clients included in the observation? Uh, there are some programs that do that in which clients can see other clients or watch other clients and then report that they're seeing the client do something well um, or they're seeing the client act out in some way and that can be used as evidence for the program and any time limitations uh, need to be included all right now that gives you kind of a basic brief overview of what contingency management is and how to create a contingency management program. The important thing to recognize with contingency management is that while it is a very effective intervention, it is best utilized in combination with other treatment methods. The idea is don't just punish and reward. You want to explore with the clients why they're making or not making decisions and use contingency management as a motivational tool rather than simply a way of controlling their behavior. Uh, anytime a client is in treatment, we are trying to motivate that client to make changes in their life and just simply issuing rewards and punishments as if we were law enforcement you know, or a judge isn't very effective. But doing this in a way where we use it as an intervention where we explain, hey, so let's talk about this. Um, you, didn't, um, you didn't have 30 days of negative UAs. You actually came up positive for marijuana this week. Um, so at this point, you're not going to be able to step down to three days a week instead of five days a week. We're gonna keep you at five days a week um, for at least the next couple of weeks. But let's talk about what happened here, right? What, what happened? Uh, why did you relapse? Was it the relapse prevention plan? Was there something that we didn't account for? So the idea here is that we are using contingency management as a tool in a conversation, rather than just saying, well, you had a positive UA, sorry, you need to continue coming five days a week. Next, that's not very effective. Uh, the idea is that contingency management is providing an opportunity for a conversation about treatment goals and targeted behaviors and it's increasing the impact of treatment goals through recognitions and rewards. All right, so that takes us to the end of this basic introduction to contingency management. Uh, there's a cute cartoon. So for every day your math grade stays below a B, your father will post a video of himself on YouTube. <laughs> All right, I hope you found that helpful. If you have any questions, as always, if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, you are free and encouraged to use the comment function. And if you're taking a class through San Diego City College, you presumably have access to me either in the classroom or through email, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.